Uh, he was ordained and installed as the fourth bishop of the Diocese of Fort Worth on June 29, 2014. Bishop Michael Olson was born in Park Ridge, Illinois uh, on June 29th. That way you write that down, his birthday, you know that. Raised in De Plain, Iowa. Uh, in 1985, the Lord blessed us when his family moved to Fort Worth. And he was ordained on June 3rd, 1994, in the Fort Worth Diocese. He has a Master's in Divinity and Master's of Art in Theological Studies. He has a doctorate. Uh, in Moral Theology from Rome, Academia Alfons uh, Alfonsiana. And he was also the rector of Holy Trinity Seminary from 2008 until one year ago. Um, gentlemen, uh, please help me welcome a man called by our Holy Father to be our shepherd, the Most Reverend Michael Olson, Bishop of Fort Worth. say, can you hear me or just aren't you listening? There's two differences. <laughs> First of all, I would like to welcome all of you and each of you here uh, to the Diocese of Fort Worth. And it's our pleasure and our privilege to uh, welcome all of you and to host uh, this men's conference. And it's my prayer that this will somehow foster your development and maturity as Christians and as members of the church. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here and also to speak with you today. Uh, the, a couple of things came to mind in, in Larry's introduction as well of me, uh, or beforehand he said, you know, how, you know, stand up and, and welcome us as you would the Apostle Paul coming in. And I thought for a moment, I said, well, I guess that depends upon what time and what period of Paul's life that would be. <laughs> I mean, the earlier period, I'd probably be heading for the doors. <laughs> Um, but any with a later period, perhaps not. I always thought, what was that like, and who was the person, first person who invited Paul to come to the to the uh, assembly gathered for Eucharist for the first time after you know? I'm sure everybody recognized him and knew who he was, since he was uh, a great persecutor of the faith. Second thing is is that also uh, it has been um, January 29th. I marked my first year as the bishop of Fort Worth. And uh, several of my priests, uh, who known me forever, uh, said to me, well, you survived the first year. <laughs> and I said, so did you. <laughs> you know? uh, so, uh, progress and not perfection. I'd like to just emphasize three points today in my talk to you. Uh, the first is, and all of them regard uh, discipleship. The first is that discipleship is first and foremost a call and a vocation. Secondly, that discipleship involves accompaniment. And thirdly, as well, that discipleship always involves listening. So again, uh, a call accompaniment and listening. As I reflected and prepared uh, for this talk as well as for several talks uh, that I've been given recently, uh, I, I've really used as a meditation uh, the account of the transfiguration and especially in particular that given in Mark's gospel and that's in the ninth chapter of Mark verses 2 through 10 and I'd invite you to listen and then as we reflect on that. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain, apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzlingly white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He hardly knew what to say. They were so terrified. Then a cloud came, casting a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice. 
This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus alone with them. As they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them not to relate what they had seen to anyone, except when the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As I said, discipleship, Christian discipleship, begins with a call or a vocation. That it's not something that we take on our own initiative. All right? We don't initiate to be baptized. And that includes, it's not just simply by the fact that so many of us are baptized as infants, but rather it's a, it's a matter of our faith that we believe that we've been called. In other words, that Christ has initiated that call and initiated our call and then also offered us the grace for a free response to follow him. Just as Peter, James, and John were called and Christ initiated that relationship of discipleship. This is significant for several reasons. First, it was very much, it's very unlike what was going on among other rabbis and other teachers at the time contemporary to Jesus' ministry. It was the usual practice that disciples would find a teacher and then they would attach themselves to that teaching and that teacher and follow him until they decided to follow somebody else. But in this case, as we read in the gospel again and again and again, Jesus calls each of his disciples, not just in a general call, but a particular call by name, by name. The intimacy of knowing someone as a friend by name. And so we have been called and initiated at Christ's initiation. We hear his call to follow him. We hear our name and the call and its expectations gradually become clearer. They're not entirely received by us, but oftentimes we only, through the light of faith, are able to see what is the next right step he asks us to take. This is very much involved and very much in line with the experience of Israel in the desert. Really, that, that translation of Moses leading the chosen people, again called and chosen by God, through the desert, is an unfortunate use of the term desert because really the word is better translates as wilderness. Because in the wilderness you have good things and you have bad things. You have animals that you can kill and eat and there are animals that will kill and eat you. It's good to discern which is which. <laughs> and that's something that is usually best passed on through wisdom by people who've survived those animals who've tried to eat them. Like Peter, James, and John, in this sense of call, in the gradual realization of what is the nature and expectation of the call that Jesus is giving them, they have this intense experience on Tabor of Jesus fully revealed not only as the Messiah or the Christ, but also as God's Son. The Father's voice speaks, this is my Son, listen to him. Many of us here, and most of us are here even because of this, have had intense experiences of transfiguration. For example, retreats, we heard several of them mentioned perhaps even intense experiences of prayer, perhaps even intense experiences of the sacrament of reconciliation, or also intense experiences of other aspects of recovery. And these experiences have within us simultaneously offered to us an intense encounter with Christ 
and have prompted also simultaneously a love and a desire and an enthusiasm and fear. That leads us to this, that that call that Christ gives us always leads to a mission. And it also, in that mission, we immediately encounter fear because we're called away from ourself. We're called into the unknown. And it is the condition of the fallen intellect to impose meaning where, frankly, there is no meaning. And what, in, what is needed is more discernment, especially through faith. Fear is antithetical to the gospel of Christ, and it's antithetical to discipleship. For the remedy for fear that Christ offers us is accompaniment. As Pope Francis again and again points out, Jesus accompanies us, and he invites us to accompany him down the mountain of Tabor to Jerusalem, the site of his sacrifice of the cross, a sacrifice that he makes in love, and then also that is fulfilled in the victory of the resurrection over death. That is not given to Peter, James, and John on Tabor. They can't understand it. It's not time to understand it. They only are offered an accompaniment with Christ. That is all that is needed. That is all that is for their sake, because the Lord offers it. But we see in the gospel as we reflect on it that Peter proposes his own remedy. That is to remain in the height of his own religious experience, alone with Jesus, enthusiastic, numbed to the fear or the terror that he's experienced by simply remaining high. He confuses enthusiasm with discipleship and accompaniment and faith. James and John soon fade away from the shared experience of Peter as it becomes about Peter and Jesus, an exclusive and autonomous spirituality, not unlike that marked by the individualism of our own culture. The confusion and inadequacy of Peter's proposed remedy soon become even more apparent because the monument to Jesus he wishes to build is the same as that he wishes to build to Moses and Elijah. Failing to see that Moses and Elijah are pointing to Jesus, it becomes apparent that Peter's offer to the Lord to build three tents or booths or monuments is more about Peter's experience than it is about the Lord. Fear without faith the faith that involves an active accompaniment with the Lord Jesus and also with his other disciples, and not disciples of our choosing, disciples of his choosing, always leads us to the preoccupation with self and lends us further into isolation. This can take the form of a prosperity gospel, steeped in selfishness and greed, given a lacquer of religious and even Christian sentiments, but takes us far away from the Lord himself. It always leads us to preoccupation with self and isolation, the hallmarks of sin and a rejection of Christ that begins with abandonment and rejection of other disciples, especially those on the margins, whereby they soon become adversaries and threats to autonomy or to my own perspective on what the gospel is teaching. It is an approach that fosters arrogance in place of confidence. Peter suggests that it's enough to be an admirer of Christ and not a disciple. And in his fear and in his enthusiasm, he suggests a path that offers waning enthusiasm and a cordial but distant relationship with Jesus. In our own culture, and our own lives, this can also affect the call to discipleship as lived in fatherhood. As Pope Francis recently pointed out, I quote, 
When children feel neglected by fathers who focus only on their problems, on their work or their own personal realization, this creates a situation of orphans in the children and youth of today who live disoriented without the good example or prudent guidance of a father. But how to get there in the prudence and guidance that the disciple is called to live? My third point, that discipleship always involves patience and it is absolutely necessary to maintain silence in accompanying Christ to Jerusalem down the mountain of Tabor. As we see in the gospel, they accompany Jesus down the mountain. They are silent but attentive. Christ's identity as the Messiah is manifested in his sonship, spoken to them by the Father. We talk too much as disciples. We make a lot of noise. We provide more heat than light, and it is the light of faith that calls us to see what is the next right thing to do that doesn't offer us a roadmap in its entirety. For if we're given a roadmap, not only would we take the wrong direction, more often than not, but we would soon no longer need the guidance of God. A roadmap invites autonomy. Faith invites solidarity a respect for the common good, as well as a recognition that our ultimate end, that is the, the basic intention of all morality, is union with God and with our neighbor, the neighbor of God's choosing, not our own. Our understanding of the significance of things that we endure and suffer can only be taken by faith until they can be fully understood after the resurrection. Faith lights the way for the next right step that we can discern. It does not provide the entire picture. It provides what the Lord knows that we need, not only for ourselves, not only for our particular families, but for the common good of society. It is the objective of the evil one our only enemy, our only adversary, to scatter the flock. Because if he can scatter the flock, he can pick them off one by one. And he begins with the wounded, he begins with the weak, he begins with the vulnerable and the poor, but he doesn't stop there. The shepherd who is Christ, the Good Shepherd. And through his ministry, and through his called ministers, each in our own stations in life, again, of his selection, not our own, is to keep the flock together. To keep the flock together, especially those who are on the margins of society, those who are near the the forest, in the dark woods, where the evil one lurks, so that we can be sheep together, listening for our shepherd's voice, attuned to it, not necessarily knowing the direction, not knowing what the future holds, but trusting the Lord God, the shepherd, who holds the future. The silence of a disciple is to attune one's ears to the voice of the Lord. We can't hear it if we talk too much, and we can't hear it in a cacophony of noise. Silence is not abandonment, it's attentiveness. The attentiveness of St. Joseph, who says just about nothing in the Gospels, but is always there, always present, always attentive, always confident always peaceful, not arrogant, not self-serving, not in any way aggressive or violent. For when we refuse to accept not only faith, but the other virtues the Lord gives us through that pathway of hope and especially charity, 
The only thing that remains from fear is resentment, anger, and ultimately violence and self-destruction. Those things which are conquered fully by the cross in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, which we can only take on faith at this moment, for that is the light that we need to see the next right step. It is good for all of us to be here today. It is good for us to be here together and to hear and see Christ revealed to us again as the beloved Son of the Father. But let's not erect any booths. Let's not set up any more tents. Let's come down the mountain together, accompanying Jesus quietly, attentive to the sound of his voice. Thank you.